Can you see the screen now? Yes, sir. So let's talk about the screening strategies. What is screening and what are different types of prevention for cancer and other diseases and how we can tackle in our country. Okay. So greetings from Ames. And uh, the first slide is showing the data of cancer occurring uh, in males per 100,000 population. So please note that on the top, we have Brazil, Brazil, with 631 cancers per 100,000 population, okay, among males, among males. So Brazil tops the list. Brazil tops the list, you can still see, can still see the screen. Hello. Sir. Yes, sir. We can see. Then comes France, five zero four, and then different states of United States of America. Italy is fairly high, and then suddenly you see four different districts or cancer registries belonging to north eastern part of India. Isol district in Mizoram, then Papa. Papam Pari district in Arunachal, then Khasi Hills again in uh, Assam, Mizoram, and Kamrup district is uh, the name given for um, Gohati, Gohati, where Kamakya temple is, the Kamrup, that area is called Kamrup uh, in Gohati, Assam. So all these states, they are matching with the, the international very high burden countries. And, uh, can you think what is common to all? The recent episode of, of the corona is very similar, isn't it? France, very high. Italy, very high. Italy had the, I mean, after China, Italy, and then the France, and then state, United States also has a very high burden of disease. And then the Northeast. When you go to ladies, again, per 100,000 population, Brazil again tops the list, 474 patients, then New Zealand, and then Switzerland, all European countries and different states of US again. And then comes again our Papampare district of Arunachal, uh, which is um, uh, near Itanagar. Itanagar is the capital of Arunachal. And Isol district, Mizoram, again Kamrup district of um, Kauhati, Mizoram, and Delhi is low down. So can you think of some common factor in all these states? Currently, corona is again present in all these states and a very high burden. So these are the northeastern states. There are eight states now, including Sikkim. Sikkim is also part of northeastern state, Arunachal, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, and Sikkim. These are eight states of northeastern region. They have the highest burden of cancer in the country, which is very similar to that of the uh, United States and Brazil and some European countries. They all are predominantly meat-eating and cut uh, societies. They, have, they consume very high amount of red meat, especially browning, you know, the uh, barbecue, they barbecue the meat, and uh, this is one reason. Then high intake of tobacco and alcohol is also very common in all these states. In fact, when you go to uh, somebody's house in Assam or Nagaland, and they will, you have have you heard the expression jalpan? So, uh, so when you go to somebody's house, they will offer jal and they will offer pan. Pan is the betel leaf, and that betel leaf must have a uh, supari. The, uh, the beetle nut, areca nut. Okay, areca nut contains many carcinogens. Now it is now well proven that areca nut is also a carcinogen. So high consumption of tobacco, alcohol, beetle nut, and red meat, smoked red meat, smoked red meat. So, so these are the main culprits for high cause. And uh, uh, it seems that uh, I mean the the current uh, data of corona pandemic 
is teaching us that uh, uh, healthy eating, predominantly uh, fruits and vegetables based, health, predominantly vegetarian diet is probably protective. And eating fresh fruits and vegetables offer you lots of vitamins, lot of antioxidants, and health enhancing benefits, which uh, is either destroyed by too much cooking, browning of the food, or by smoking of the food, barbecuing the food, too much frying the food. They say if you fry anything, whether it is uh, making chips, uh, you know, potato chips, or frying a fish, or frying some meat, or making puri or paratha, if you make it brown, you have induced carcinogenesis. Browning produces carcinogen, whether it is in a food or frying. Another thing is being found that if you use any oil for frying, don't reuse it because again carcinogens are produced. So that oil which has been used once for frying should not be used. So all these factors probably incriminate and result in high burden of many diseases including cancer and including perhaps coronavirus. And Mr. Bill Gates has recently said that we have stopped eating natural foods. Starting to preserve foods, pizza, noodles, burgers, they all preserve foods. So that has reduced our immunity against coronavirus and against many other diseases. Okay. Coming back to the cancer situation, so if you take all both genders, all cancers, we experienced 11 lakh new cases, 11 lakh 57,000 cases occurred in the year 2018. And of these, 1,62,000 occurred in the mammary gland. 14% of all cancers in Indian population involved mammary gland. Okay, the commonest cancer of Indian race, Indian society. Uh, cervix was second. Uh, cervix was, uh, well, oral cavity, if you take all cases of oral cavity, that will be second, 10%. And third would be cervix uteri, and then lung and then stomach, and all others are in minor proportions. You take only ladies, then in 2018, 5,87,000 ladies developed cancer in some part of their body. Of these, 1,62,000 occurred in the breast. So 27% of all cancers in ladies, among ladies, involve breast. 16% was the cervix, Ovary being 6%, and all others are minus, minor, minuscule proportion, 4.8, less than 5%, colorectal tree. So these are not the burdens. And then this is a miscellaneous group of all other cancers put together. Please note in year 2018, we experienced 5 like 87,000 ladies developing cancer. Of these, 27%, that is 1,62,000 ladies developed breast cancer, ominous cancer of Indian mother and also in the rest of the world. So each year around 11, and every year this number is increasing. Every year this number is increasing, and new cases are being encountered, and of these, unfortunately, about 80% or so succumb to their advanced disease because they present far, far too late. The most common cancers among sisters and mothers in India, involve the breast, the memory gland, the brain cervix, and the mouth, the oral cavity. About 34% of all cancers involve breast, cervix, and and mouth. If you take a metropolitan cancer registry like that of uh, Delhi, uh, uh, just to tell you about uh, the cancer registries in India, uh, we have a very close and well documented network of cancer uh, in our country and uh, they are run by uh, managed by indian council of medical research icmr so icmr is the sort of global, you know the hub uh, they collect the data from various population based registries so some of them are hospital based and others are population based so in Delhi, Bombay, Madras, 
Bangalore, Calcutta, all the big towns, they have population-based registries. There's one rural registry in uh, the state of Maharashtra. Uh, there's a district called Latur. And in Latur, there is a village called Barsi, B-A-R-S-I, Barsi. Uh, there, they have a rural registry. So all these registries pool their data. And all the pathologists across the country, whenever they have, they diagnose they diagnose a case of cancer, they have to inform their um, the National Cancer Registry. Okay. Uh, all any cancer diagnosed has to be reported and uh, the cancer registry workers, uh, they do a great job collecting the data from not only the government hospitals, but also the private hospitals, private pathologists, practitioners who just do the pathology diagnosis. You know, even their data is collected. So in males in Delhi, they noted lung cancer, right, as the commonest. Lung cancer is the commonest, and mouth, and then prostate. Among ladies, we found that breast cancer was the commonest. Cervix being the second, gallbladder third, ovary fourth, and corpus uterus, the body of endometrial cancer, being the fifth. So if you take top five cancers, among ladies, they are breast, cervix, gallbladder, ovary, and cervix. So three belonging to the uh, female genital tract, uterine, ovary, and cervix, and other two are gallbladder and breast. So five cancers, if you focus your attention in the early detection and proper treatment of these five cancers, you will save lots of mothers and sisters in our country. Let's go to a rural registry. This is run by Tata Memorial Hospital, Tata Memorial Center, about 20 years ago. And they launched the Rural Cancer Registry in Barshi, uh, part of Latu district. And uh, there's a small hospital run by Tata Memorial, and they collect the data very extensively, both in males and females. So there, mouth cancer is the commonest, mouth, number one and esophagus, liver, and all rectum, that proportion. Cervix is the commonest there. And breast is uncommon, only 12%. Okay, so you can see that the distribution of cancer in the cities, big cities, metropolitan township, breast the commonest, cervix second. In rural areas, cervix top, and breast second, and all others, ovary and lungs. So can you think of any factor or group of factors which lead to this uh, disproportionate distribution of or occurrence of cancer in the two townships, a major metropolitan town as opposed to a small rural setup? So in the rural uh, population, uh, the ladies have more childbirth and the age of first childbirth is uh, much earlier compared to the urban uh, lifestyles. Apart from that, uh, other uh, modifiers in the urban lifestyle like obesity and uh, smoking alcohol uh, may be uh, important factors for uh, increased uh, incidence of breast cancer. And in the rural population, there is less... Uh, knowledge of uh, safe uh, sexual practices which may uh, lead to an increased occurrence of cervical cancer. You mean uh, in infection, cervicitis by FPV virus? And not use of uh, barrier device. Right. Yes. Uh, it has been observed that uh, having late minarche and late minarche and that is after 12 and early first childbirth around age 20 to 22 and breastfeeding the baby for two to two years uh, one to two years these are three protective factors late minarche early childbirth and breastfeeding these are protective factors it has been observed that if young girls fall in vigorous athletic activities like you know, uh, sports, you can so think of outdoor sports, or doing 
physically strain us work at home or in the field. So what happens in the villages? They go, they get up at three or four o'clock. I have actually seen it, and they then go to feed the cows. Okay, cow shewa, cow shala. Then they milk the cow. They go to the field early in the morning, and if they don't have a hand pump at home, they will also go to the well to fetch water. Then go to the field early in the morning and do a lot of hard work. Bring fresh fruits and vegetables from the farm, and this freshly picked vegetables and fruits are then cooked. At home, they do, um, you know, again cooking the food. They don't have, you know, the chakki or you know, ready-made atta. So they will use the uh, the. If you have gone to a village, you'll see a chakki, you know, a rounded stone like grounding machine. You can say hand drill or machine to ground the atta. Then they take out the butter from the milk. Have you seen the picture of Yashoda Ma with the baby Krishna and Yashoda Ma is, you know. Taking, churning the milk or churning the curd, yogurt, dahi, uh, taking out the butter. So they do that. So this all involves a lot of hard work. Therefore, obesity is very uncommon in, among rural uh, ladies. And this hard work, perhaps starting early in childhood, leads to late menarche. Late menarche is, pre is protective. In US and European communities, they are now encouraging young girls. In, this, in the school or in the outside the community to engage in a uh, lot of athletic activities to delay the onset of minarke. Otherwise, they will have early minarke before 12 and that is a risk factor. Early minarke. So you can delay the minarke by engaging the young girls in rigorous activities. Obesity, childhood obesity is a bad thing. It persists throughout life. So again, Engaging in strenuous activities or games or athletic activities will reduce the risk of childhood obesity. Then, what are these young, very uh, you know, aspiring ladies doing in the cities? You can see in the medical schools. You can see in other professions also. They want to be uh, first uh, finish their undergraduate education. And I'm not blaming them. This is the state of affairs today. Then they want to do the post graduation, then super MCH, and then um, they want to get faculty position or you know. So by that time they are delaying the first childbirth, and once they have the baby, they will, for various reasons, due to work pressure, they may not be able to feed the baby for long time. So in in big cities, in big townships. And then there's a lot of stress. Stress has been found to be a factor causing cancer. There's not a lot of data. Now. So stress is a factor and fast running life and big townships like Bombay and Delhi and other places. Then there is so much of pollution. Air we breathe is polluted. Water we drink is polluted. Food we eat has also a lot of contaminants, heavy metals and Toxins. It has been found that the air pollutant can cause epigenetic changes in the DNA. Even if you are not born with genetic mutation uh, like BRCA1 or BRCA2, your DNA gets damaged by the presence of air pollution. And this causes the epigenetic changes and increases the risk of cancer and many other things. So, a number, number of factors, you know. Uh, add together to have this change in the presentation and occurrence of cancer, more cancers in big townships and less uh, of the cancer of the breast in low, low rural population. It has been estimated that if this rate of increase of cancer and their death continues at the same rate as it is happening today, by the year 2035, by year 2035, we'll have a corona epidemic-like situation for cancers. Nobody bothers about cancers. So 
you saw the data, how many were dying? Uh, it's not showing death, but nearly half are half, you know, died. So out of 162 breast and total of 5 lakh 87,000, nearly 50% dead. So two and a half lakhs. So, but nobody bothers about each year, two and a half lakh girl, ladies are dying. And uh, if you see the total total burden, out of 11 lakh, nearly 50%, five, five or six lakhs are dying, total population of India. And sorry, so out of 11 lakh new cases, nearly half died, right? Five to six lakhs. And we, are, we are just have how many deaths? About 1300. Right? due to corona and there's so much paralysis and lockdown of the machinery so just think that we do not react to the major burden somebody told me this morning that seven lakh children each year die in india due to malnutrition and diarrheal diseases and infectious seven lakh each year which is largely preventable so too much of you know reaction of the society and the community to a particular disease uh, and just ignoring ignoring cancers because the slow death nobody bothers about it you know so this is their proportion so red line depicts the incidence of new cases among females so red on the top you know more ladies will have breast cancer or another cancers Blue line is the total number of cases in males, so that will, uh, you know, rise to a very great proportion. 900, 900 new cases will occur, and among uh, there will be more deaths in both genders. The green line is number of deaths in males, and blue is the purple is the death in females. Both the occurrence and the mortality due to cancer in both genders will rise to a great proportion, probably much more than coronavirus by year 2035, if we do not act now. If we do not uh, take, uh, you know, uh, take this problem on a war footing basis and get a military-like action now, we will lose the battle, uh, not only on corona, but also on cancer. So, to take overall incidence of breast cancer, about in an average, 25 to 30 new cases occur each per 100,000 population. If you go to United States, this data is 140. 140 new cases each year per 100,000 population. So we are still low below, much below, you know, the U.S. burden. But still, it is rising and it is more in the urban population compared to the urban village. Only six to seven new cases per 100,000. Highest data is recorded. It's uh, city of Mumbai, Chennai, and then. Okay. Uh, the good thing about it that uh, in India, about 40% cancers are related to tobacco, 15% to infections, infections caused by human papilloma virus and hepatitis B virus causing the hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, so. And about 10% due to lifestyle related conditions such as obesity, sedentary lifestyle, use of alcohol, uh, tobacco stated separately. So they are all preventable. You can prevent the use of tobacco, you can ban tobacco totally. Uh, and uh, you remember a long time ago, our present health minister, when he was health minister in the previous uh, um, regime, he he uh, put a ban on public use of tobacco and uh, put a heavy fine if somebody smoked or used tobacco in a public place. So that has made a great impact, but we need to ban tobacco in its, all its form. We need to ban the cultivation of tobacco. Tobacco has no health enhancing effect at all. And uh, uh, it is sad to learn that there is an institute government-funded institute of tobacco research, do you know? And what is its objective? To enhance the yield, the crop yield, productivity of tobacco cultivation. Right. 
so all these are preventable causes and we can achieve we uh, we can achieve victory over this menace uh, in a more effective manner perhaps than we are able to achieve the victory over corona where we do not know the exact treatment of it well cancer can be prevented by three strategies the primary prevention secondary prevention and the tertiary prevention three approaches to uh, prevention of any thing including cancer primary prevention is defined as action taken in the society before the onset of disease so disease has not set in so in english they say nip in the bud nip in the bud right so nip in the bud or primary prevention may be accomplished by two kind of activities health promotion and specific protection so in the health promotion we can do uh, you know general lifestyle improvement such as um, exercise regular exercise controlling their weight eating fresh fruits and vegetables predominantly vegetarian diet avoiding um, you know saturated animal fat uh, avoiding red meat and uh, alco avoiding alcohol so these will be and avoiding living in very polluted area and specific protection will be in the form of uh, some specific measures like vaccine hpv vaccine is an example hepatitis b vaccine is an example of specific protection against certain cancers here we know the exact cause so it is stated that 30% of cancers can be prevented by practice of quitting the tobacco use adopting a healthy lifestyle and diet which is health enhancing diet and limiting the use of alcohol limiting the use of alcohol 20% of cancer deaths can be prevented by immunization against human papilloma virus and we all have heard that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure old british saying an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure so we are fortunate in our country to have the most eminent screening expert in the world dr ranga swami shankar narayanan he is a radiation oncologist by training from pti chandigarh and then he spent his lifetime uh, studying how to prevent and how to screen cancers he uh, has been associated with the uh, trivandrum cancer uh, institute the regional cancer center in trivandrum tiruvananthpuram and uh, he was the chief of cancer screening wing in lyon in france uh, who has a cancer wing is called international agency for research in cancer iarc and dr shankar narayanan was the chief of iarc for a long time he still is a consultant and uh, we are fortunate to learn a lot about his training from him so he found that uh, you can inject the human papilloma virus vaccine at different dosage in young girls girls between age 9 to 14 and prevent the diseases related to hpv vaccine and hpv virus these are the not only the papilloma but also the cancer of the cervix and cancer of the nasopharynx and rarely cancer of the vulva and among males cancer of the male genitalia they're all related to hpv virus infection and so these four cancers cancer of the cervix cervix vulva and then uh, uh, nasopharynx and uh, male genitalia all can be prevented if we use two doses of uh, vaccine so he did a lot of trials and whereas who was recommending three doses of vaccines he found that two doses are enough at six months apart so you give one dose in young girls school girls age 9 to 14 and then repeat another dose six months later and this very effective this is a paper from so this is an example of specific specific prevention of cancer by a vaccine right so four cancers can be prevented by just one vaccine and if you add hepatitis vaccination again you can prevent 
hepatitis related uh, deaths and hepatocellular carcinoma of the liver so what what is secondary prevention it's defined as an action at the public health uh, level it halts the progression of a disease cancer has already set in right these cells have become neoplastic they are progressing at a initially at a lower pace very slow pace and we can detect the disease in a very early stage and then prevent its uh, progression and untoward effects like from then the metastasis and you know uh, and its complications so that is called secondary prevention halt the progress of a disease which has already set in and prevent its complications so what can we do for in the secondary prevention early diagnosis detect the disease in early in situ stage we know that all epithelial neoplasms wherever they arise from an epithelial cell epithelial cell rests on a on a basement membrane right you have a basement membrane and then lamina propria whether it's mouth or breast duct or uh, cervical um, you know lining they all have a common structure that is the epithelial cells then lamina then basement membrane and then the sub basement membrane lamina propria and then submucosa in sub dermis will be in the skin and submucosa in other areas so all epithelia have this common structure as long as cancer cells have not invaded through the basement membrane cancers are curable cancers acquire the ability to progress and kill and metastasize only and only when they have invaded the basement membrane so if we detect the disease in very early stage and in situ stage we can prevent death due to cancers so we have to apply a screening test a screening test which has high sensitivity in picking up the disease um, and then adequate and timely and appropriate treatment appropriate and timely treatment of the cancer and pre cancer will also come in this heading okay so is screening uh, so this takes us to the process of screening screening is defined as a public health measure to detect the disease in asymptomatic individuals asymptomatic members of the society please note here that we are person of person is not a patient he or she is a normal looking or normally feeling person on the in the society on the street and he or she does not visit a clinic or a hospital so we go to their house say madam or sir we want to check your body for any presence of disease just as they are doing screening for corona virus among asymptomatic individuals in many countries they are doing this asymptomatic screening in korea they did it and in america many states they are trying to do it so this is how you will know who has that disease in early stage and so cancer screening is not just a diagnostic test to detect the disease it's a long run process public health process of organized detection then you have to once you detected it behoves on you it's your responsibility to offer and provide appropriate and timely treatment for that cancer and then have a long term evaluation monitoring of that person for assessing all the benefits and harms caused by screening screening may cause some harms as well we'll discuss that later so that's screening screening i used to think the screening is just a diagnostic test you apply say like a mammogram or ultrasound or liver ultrasound for gallstone and that's it no screening is much more than that it's a public health measure it's a process organized process of detection treatment and long term surveillance and monitoring to assess all the benefits and harms induced by it. so this is 
so this uh, so this is the, these are the concepts of screening primary secondary and tertiary prevention oh by the way we did not do the tertiary so what is tertiary prevention i may have a slide at the end but if i miss then what is tertiary prevention can somebody tell what is tertiary prevention uh, sir disability limitation and rehabilitation right so cancer is in case of cancer cancer is set in and uh, if they develop uh, advanced disease say for example in breast you know it's not that much of rehabilitation but say say sarcoma of the lower leg or somebody uh, has amputation so you have to rehabilitate that person back to the society somebody has this hand amputation so you have to rehabilitate in order to get him back to the normal life so that is tertiary prevention and in case of advanced cancers you can say all the activities for palliative care palliative care relief relief for pain relief of vomiting relief of intestinal obstruction and all those measures taken for the relief of symptoms palliative care can also be taken as that okay so the primary and then secondary prevention then comes the screening so okay so how is breast cancer arising it's arising from the mammary ducts 90% of the cancer breast arises from the mammary ducts that's why it is called ductal cancer 10% arises from these globules it's called lobular cancer so there is a rule of 10 for lobular cancer rule of 10 is 10% of all cancer of the breast lobular 10% multicentric one cancer here one cancer here hey i can explain that the concept of multicentricity and multifocality with this bunch of grapes now why am i showing the bunch of grapes what is the relationship between a bunch of grape and the mammary gland can somebody think mammary gland is a racemose uh, gland uh, which is composed of the subunits like good very good racemose is a term from botany and in botany racemose means bunch of grapes so any organization of the gland or ductal system or any system you know which has this structure organization of units and subunits is called racemose so we have uh, borrowed this term racemose from botany so what we have here a small ductule here a small lobule this is the milk secreting unit it's called acinus or alveolus acinus or alveolus is this one grape okay it is producing some milk which is drained by this terminal ductule this is terminal ductule terminal ductule many such terminal ductule join to form bigger ducts bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger ultimately you reach the major duct major duct is this uh, stalk by which the shopkeeper gives you a bunch of grapes ma'am uh, 10 rupees for this bunch of grapes okay so that is the major duct and we have how many major ducts are there in the average mammary gland 15 to 20 15 to 20 ducts near the nipple if you cut a transverse section like this you will get 15 to 20 milk ducts of those seven only half will join the ductal system and carry the milk remaining seven are blind i don't know why nature produced it there must be some purpose we have failed to unravel the mystery of nature we don't know the cause of cancer we, we don't know we have to work hard so all the young boys and girls all the young residents uh, i invite you all to do extensive studies and research to unravel many mysteries of nature including this one we don't know the cause of cancer you know? we have to unravel a lot of mysteries so so what is happening in the 90% occur in the ductal system called ductal cancers 10% in the lobules called lobular carcinoma what are the rule of 10 for lobular 10% bilateral 10% multicentric uh, okay. 10% uh, so 10% of all cancers are lobular 10% multicentric 10% lobular now uh, what must be done in a lady where biopsy shows lobular MRI should be done. Yes, MRI must be done. Why MRI? Because MRI is most sensitive method of picking up 
uh, lesions in the breast. The multicentricity is best detected by contrast enhanced MRI. Ordinary MRI is no good. The lady has to lie prone in an MRI machine where they have breast coils. So there are two holes. If you visit a, a place where MRI machine is used, is, is uh, established for doing breast mammogram, a breast MRI. So it's a, there are two holes in the table. And the lady lies prone. The memory glands hang through these holes into the breast coils. And then they give contrast. So it has to be contrast enhanced using breast coils. Then only MRI of the breast is of some. So MRI detects the multicentricity. So now what is multicentricity? Cancer arises from this ductal system. TDLU. Terminal alveolus will its duct is called TDLU, right? Terminal ductal lobular system. You remember that A N D I video? You have you all yes, have sir. downloaded that N D video, A N D I. So you can play it again on your computer and understand. So most breast cancers arise from a TDLU. So one cancer arises here, another cancer arises here, third arises here. We have multicentricity. If we do mammogram ultrasound or even clinical palpation for large lumps, you will see one, two, and three lumps. And they'll be located in different quadrants. So one will be rising, say, upper area, upper half, other is the lower half. This is multicentric. They are arising from different ductolobular system. Okay. If you do MRI, again you will pick up more lesions. And if you measure the distance between these three or two, it will be more than four centimeters. So this is the definition of multicentricity and treatment is doing a full mastectomy. Full mastectomy. So multifocal, what is happening? Tumor is arising from this either TDLU, this lobule or adjoining duct. Then it spreads, it spreads through the same ductal system. This is called cancerization of the duct. Cancerization of the duct, right? So cancer is creeping like a reptile. It's creeping inside the lumen. Just like transluminal spread of cancer in the colon. Have you, you remember? In colon cancer, they say there is transluminal spread. Transluminal spread in the colon. Yeah. From transverse colon, tumor can go to the descending colon or uh, in the sigmoid colon or rectum. So this transluminal spread. This is called cancerization of the duct. Similarly, if cancer is arising here in the duct, it can go to the nearby lobule. This is called cancerization of the lobule. So due to cancerization of the lobule or duct, tumor can spread from one lobule to other, right? Or one part of the ductal system to the other, and you will have two foci. One focus here, one focus here. But they are in the same ductolobular system. And if you happen to measure their genetic signature it is the same genetic signature in the two areas okay and because it's arising in the same ductal system so come to the actual ductal system one tumor is arising here and through the cancerization of the duct the spread transluminal spread it has reached this area and probably then gone to this ductal system it's arising from same segment so they are within four centimeter distance to each this is Multi, what is it? No, focal, multifocal. Multi -focal. So, arising from the same ductal system, ductal lobular system, and then due to cancerization of the duct and lobule, it has spread from one part of the segment into the other part. Okay, and because they are in the neighborhood, they usually have a distance less than four centimeter, less than four centimeter, and we can perform. We can still perform a wide local excision. Okay. If there are three in one line, we can do one segment tectomy. Just as Dr. Alberto Veronese performed a quadrant tectomy, he removed one fourth of the breast in T1 tumors in Milan 1 trial, the first trial which showed the benefit and safety of breast conservation, Milan 1 trial. Right. So you can do a segment tectomy or lobectomy. If you have two or three lesions in a row, all arising from the same ductolobular system, multifocal. So in multifocal, we can do breast conservation 
in multicentric, we cannot do breast conservation. We have to do mastectomy. So please try to understand these. Okay. So the TDLU concept, the lobule and adjoining terminal duct together. So lobule and the duct. Lobule and the duct. Together called TDLU. So it is thought that the normal milk ducts have a single layer of luminal cell and a basal cell. Okay, luminal cell also called A cell and basal cell called B cells. A and B. In Hindi, we say A say under B say Bahar. Okay, so easy to remember. A cell, luminal cell, and B cell, basal cells. A cells are responsible for producing the milk. They have the maximum preponderance of estrogen progesterone receptors. B cell may lack it. Okay. B cell cells give rise to triple negative cancer, hormone negative cancers. Luminal cells produce luminal A and luminal B type of breast cancer. That's why so these nomenclature is arisen from this structure. Okay. So normal ducts has single layer lining or luminal cell. If the ductal epithelium becomes more than two layers, so here you have three layers. So if more than two layer, the pathologists use the term hyperplasia. Hyperplasia. Okay. Now, still these cells looking exactly normal under the microscope. Then their behavior is normal. They respond to estrogen progesterone the way normal epithelial cells do. And in each menstrual cycle, they proliferate in the you know, uh, mostly in the luteal phase. And then after uh, day 28 of the menstrual cycle, they suddenly atrophy. And this cycle goes on. Cyclical changes the breast of changes of the ND. And they go on. Right. Here, the cells have become abnormal. And this is called atypical ductal hyperplasia. So more than two layers of cells. And cells are atypical. They are abnormal. Also uh, called dysplastic. So dysplastic or atypical cells is called atypical ductal hyperplasia, ADH. If the same phenomena occurs in the lobule, we'll call it atypical lobular hyperplasia, ADH or ALH. Okay. Still, the changes are preventable. If we withdraw the stimulus, stimulus is what? Estrogen. So if we give anti-estrogen drug like tamoxifen, like raloxifen, like anestrozole, we can abate, abate, we can suppress, we can stop, halt the progression of this atypical hyperplasia further to cancer. So we can, pre we can prevent cancer. So it is our duty as doctors, as healthcare providers to predict and then prevent cancer. How we do? We have to think, we have to learn, we have to do research. So all the young uh, boys and girls have this task of predicting and preventing and doing more research. Now, once this, this Lakshman Rekha is broken, then we enter into second uh, zone and that second zone is where the these abnormal cells have really become mad the dna has become mutant a duct and then uh, due to their mutation the dna repair process stopped and the antimicrotic activity you know normal cells have a programmed cell death phenomenon apoptosis the loss of apoptosis results in proliferation of these cells and what is the difference between ADH and ductal carcinoma in situ? It's only the size and the number. If you have this change in two ducts only, in two ducts, it is called ADH. If you have three ducts, it is called ductal carcinoma in situ. They also measure the size. There's a small, uh, like a vernier caliper on their eyepiece in the, camp, in the uh, microscope. With that ocular micrometer, they can measure the size of the lesion. The size is more than two millimeter, more than two. Two ducts or two millimeter, it will be called ductal carcinoma in situ. So less than two, less than two layer cells, norm. Okay, two is normal. More than two layer cells, hyperplasia. Two more than two with abnormality, madness, mad mad cells, a typical ductal hyperplasia. Within two millimeter or only two ducts, ADH. 
more than 2 mm or more, more than 2 ducts involvement, ductal carcinoma in situ. So it's only the number and the size. Therefore, again, it's our duty to perform a proper. Suppose you have a nodule which looks uh, Virat's 4 and 5 on mammogram. We have to excise that lesion. It is said that all Virat's 4 lesion must be excised. If you do not excise and only biopsy a part of it, and you take only, say, two ducts, you don't know whether the third duct also has that lesion. And the name will change. If we have a lesion, you should excise it completely. And if you have only two ducts involved, which measures less than 2 mm, we have a typical ductal hyperplasia. More than two ducts, 3 millimeter or more, it is cancer, it is carcinoma inside. Similarly, uh, in the lobule, we'll have ALH. And from ALH, what will happen? Lobular carcinoma in situ and then frank invasive carcinoma. The difference here is the basement membrane is intact here and here basement membrane is broken. So just to summarize, up to this stage, we can prevent. So our duty is to predict. Once it has set into this stage, then we have to detect it and treat it appropriately and early. Otherwise, there will be problem of and invasive and death. So, uh, normal duct, only one layer luminal, one layer basal, more than two ducts, basal membrane is still intact, side to ADH or DCIS. Basal membrane is breached, broken, you have cells coming out, and this becomes invasive carcinoma. Later on, this invasive cancer cells and they digest the, they have MMP, metalloproteinases, but no, MMP protein, the enzymes digest the tissue cement and then they digest the basin membrane and then digest the, what are the layers of a capillary? Please somebody can tell. You have a basin membrane which consists of laminin, laminin. And type 4 collagen. Laminin and type 4 collagen, two layers, two proteins. Laminin and type 4 collagen. The cancer cell must produce the enzyme to digest the laminin and the type 4 collagen before it can enter the lumen of a vessel. And entry of the lumen, cancer into the lumen of the vessel is called intravasation. 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 It has entered the vessel. Intravasation. So first, di first step is digesting the basal membrane of the duct by the enzymes MMP and then digesting the tissue cement. Third step, digesting the laminin and type 4 collagen of the vessel wall, entering the cell, intravasation. Then they will circulate to different uh, organs by hematogenesis spread. In case of breast, they go to lungs, liver, brain, and bones. And, uh, you know, by and large, they can spread to other organs. Uh, and one uh, unique organ is uh, adrenal. You know, some have, they have a preponderance to go to adrenal. Isolated adrenal metastasis sometimes seen in melanoma and in breast. Uh, so, okay. Uh, so, intravasation and where they want to settle, they will then reverse this process. So, you know, epithelial cells, epithelial cells like this do not have legs. They are fixed like uh, bricks on a, uh, or tiles on a floor. If you go to uh, some roads, you know, even in the in the floor, uh, we have tiles. Okay, so those tiles are fixed. The tiles do not move. But if you want to go from from Delhi to Bombay, you have to move, go to airport, then sit in the plane, and then. so epithelial cells cannot move. They are fixed. What cells move in the body? Blood cells. Blood cells are mesodermal cells, mesenchymal cells. So mesenchymal cells in the body have the ability by pseudopodia-like projection, just like amoeboid movement, they move. That's why tissue, uh, the blood monocytes, blood monocytes enter into the tissues and they become macrophages. So macrophages and monocyte system are mesodermal cells, mesenchymal cells. They have the ability to move by pseudopodial, just amoeboid activity. So if cancer cells want to go from point A to point B, they must become mesenchymal. So this change of epithelial cell to mesenchymal cell is called E2M phenomena. E2M. 
epithelial to mesenchymal transformation epithelial to mesenchymal transformation e to f phenomena now having reached say bone and then they want to settle make a home in the bone so the reversal of that process will occur again they have to break the lamellar and cypore collagen of the vessel wall break the base and membrane go out into the bone uh, matrix in the bone marrow particularly and there they have to go back to their original original structure right and that is called m to e phenomena mesenchymal to epithelial phenomena so e to m epithelial to mesenchymal transformation at the site of primary tumor and m to e phenomena at the site of metastatic deposits and this process of going out is called extravasation extravasation of cancer cell and then met mesenchymal to epithelial transformation m to e phenomena and then they settle down you can imagine uh, say suppose uh, we send a spy to some other country okay so what do they do uh, spy they they change their you know their shape you know or their clothes you know or their outer garments attire and their height so they change their outer structure right and uh, while in hiding then they go to in enemy's country and there they do the job and then they uh, you know transform themselves into like normal human being and they do their task so similarly you know like a, a spy going from one country to other they change the cells their behavior their appearance epithelial to mesenchymal and mesenchymal to epithelial form so this is how cancer spreads so we have a scenario where healthy cells under the influence of some uh, multiple factors it is always multiple factors you know a cancer and for that matter uh, no event no event in the uh, mother nature is caused by single factor even tuberculosis is caused not just by micro infection by mycobacterium tuberculosis you have to have lower immunity you have to have a quantum of minimum quantum of infection the bacteria and the virus has to be virulent see many people currently are being detected uh, as having corona virus but they don't have symptoms so you have to have high virulence and so many factors so everything is multifactorial including cancer so under the influence of those multifactorial carcinogens healthy cells become abnormal atp and then pre invasive early ecis and then increase. so here we have this early stage has not yet spread and not has caused death okay so so far symptoms have not set in so we are talking of we are talking of pre symptomatic or asymptomatic early stage asymptomatic this is the process of screening detecting the disease in asymptomatic individuals right and you apply that test on the population and find that say two out of these so many individuals have the disease all them has cancer and then you but still it is a pre invasive so you have the ability you have the potential mm -hmm. to offer cure so that's the mm -hmm. beauty of screening detecting the disease in pre invasive stage that's the hypothesis once disease spreads becomes more invasive um, you know by the way what is the minimum size of cells or population of cells when a lump becomes palpable in the breast can somebody tell what's the size sir so 10 to the power 14 cells hey 14 percent will be dead sorry sorry 10 to the power 7 10 to power 7 about 1 cm mass has an average of 10 to the power 7 cells 10 to the power 5 is 1 milli 1 mm pin head size 10 to the power 5 1 mm and that is the point when angiogenesis sets up 10 to the power 5 cells 1 million cells 1 million okay so that's the onset of angiogenesis at 10 to the power 7 we have about 1 cm size lump but in very lean and thin individuals uh, a careful breast examination can detect even 5 mm nodule in fact the study that we just finished uh, we found that 7 mm 7 mm nodule could be uh, felt by our fingers by clinical breast examination so we can pick up uh, even 7 mm studies have shown up to 5 mm in very superficial uh, lumps in very lean and thin individuals 
So that's a stage when cancer is spreading and if left untreated, it may lead to death. So whatever we do here is the early detection and then proper treatment. So we are talking of patients, we are talking of patients. Here we are talking of population, healthy persons. Some of them have hidden disease like asymptomatic carrier of corona, Sim similar to that. Okay, so again, just to show you from onset, nobody knows when the cancer actually sets in. But we know that if we do some abnormality, some biopsy, some mammogram detected four or five lesion, and we can show dysplasia or atypia, it's a low grade lesion, and then it becomes high grade, then becomes in situ, then invasive, and then progresses to death. Okay, so our job in the population is to carry out screening and detect the disease in this this plastic stage before in cancer sets in. So again, just to show that picture from hyperplasia to ADH up to here, up to here we can apply the detection of early disease. Once you have cancer, then we are doing treatment of disease. Okay. And this is state, the term detectable preclinical phase. Detectable preclinical phase, DPCP, means by some method, whether by palpation or by mammogram or by high resolution ultrasound, if you are able to detect the stage when it is not asymptomatic, not symptomatic, patient has no pain, no, she does not feel a lump, she has no blood discharge, she has no breast pain or nipple retraction, means there are no symptoms pertaining to breast cancer. In that state, if you have a test which can pick up the disease in this detectable preclinical phase. So what is detectable preclinical phase? We cannot detect it on cell. We cannot detect probably hyperplasia unless there is a lump and you do biopsy and it shows hyperplasia. But by and large, we are able to detect this dysplastic stage by a high resolution imaging such as mammography or MRI or DPC. Okay. So uh, we are fortunate to learn a lot uh, from um, a great uh, expert in breast cancer, Professor Ismail Jatoi, uh, Chief of uh, Surgical Oncology and uh, Endocrine Surgery at the University of Texas, San Antonio. And uh, uh, you can read uh, his papers and his book on management of breast disease. Um, it's published by Springer and he has great, you know, details and management and screening. So he's also expert in breast screening. So he teaches this screening like this, that at point A, there is inception of cancer, but we have no way of knowing it. Okay. In other words, DPCP is not there. Detectable preclinical phase is not there. So this is the first time that we are able to detect by screening. So this is the DPCP. Remember that DP, DPCP, detectable preclinical phase. Okay, detectable preclinical phase. So by uh, applying a screening test in asymptomatic individual, when the tumor has become DPCP detectable by some method, then we treat it. Okay. And we will measure her life. And then suppose she dies at point D. So her cancer is detectable, detected by screening at point B. And then she lives for uh, these many years, 20 years, for example. And then she dies at point D. Okay. Now you compare her lifespan with another lady where uh, she did not have any screening. She waited till a lump develops, then went to a doctor, and then she was diagnosed, and then she was treated. So her life, and then she also dies at time D. Okay. So her lifespan will be measured from point C to point D. Okay. So a screen detected cancer lives for point B to D. B to D. So survival in a screen detected cancer is from point B to D. Okay. B to D. In a clinically detected cancer, she lives we'll say that her survival is from C to D, right? Okay, is that clear? These terms, C to D, hello? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, 
no so what is the difference we i mean we are presuming that both ladies will die at the same day whether it's detected at 1 mm or at 10 cm this is the assumption this is the assumption and i don't agree with uh, this assumption and we keep uh, you know having healthy argument with professor jagavi and his team about this point um, anyway so he says that this time from b to c is called lead time bias so when you read the screening literature you will find this term lead time bias so lead time bias says that we have not we have not really cured cancer she is still dying at point d still dying at point d we have only prolonged her we are seemingly we seemingly not not truly seemingly we have increased her survival from b to d and the difference compared to a lady who was picked up at c and then died at d so dr jatoi says that this b to c b to c time interval we think we think that we have advanced her survival by this time okay and this is called lead time bias lead time lead time okay so we have advanced her diagnosis by this period and therefore we think that we have increased her survival by this interval b to c now coming to the question of why we should have a screening in all communities so this young girl college graduate at age 22 noticed a lump few months ago and by the time she reached us she had a diffuse memory gland mass over the branch filling the entire breast so if we have redness and edema filling more than one third of the breast and history is less than 6 months what do we call it clinical diagnosis inflammatory breast cancer that's very good so it's called inflammatory breast cancer redness and edema involving more than one third of the breast history goes to less than 6 months and what are the tests that you must do besides mammogram if you can do it it's difficult sometimes to compress you know it may be painful and it's very hard rock hard ultrasound okay. and cooper scan and a punch biopsy of the skin it matters hard in nodules of the skin two punch biopsies if you don't have a skin biopsy punch just take 11 number blade triangular blade and take about you know 2 to 3 mm piece of a skin uh, from two areas or just one area on straight what we should expect in the pathology report tumor emboli in the subdermal lymphatic subdermal lymphatic plexus tumor emboli in subdermal lymphatic plexus that's the cause of it the lymphatics are blocked there are tumor emboli in subdermal lymphatic plexus and this is what is the cause of this edema retrograde lymphatic spread nodes are blocked and the lymph cannot go to the axilla it reverse goes comes back regurgitates as if your uh, toilet uh, sink or in the bathroom sink or the kitchen sink is blocked so water comes back in the sink and this is a regurgitation of that dirty water and this spills in the membrane tissue as well as in the skin and it fills in the skin and it causes edema of the skin hair follicles cannot rise because that's a pit so intervening skin gets raised and this leads to further on so this girl had advanced cancer and when we evaluated her uh, body by a pet ct scan with chlorine 18 uh, deoxy glucose and uh, deoxy because uh, we got multiple tumor deposits in both glands and virtually in her entire body was riddled with innumerable tumor deposits so just just tell the uh, effect of a name of a gentleman who won a physicist to won a nobel prize in uh, back in 1930 otto warburg 31 otto warburg otto warburg otto warburg said that tumor cells eat only glucose for their energy substrate and if you give glucose in attached to some isotope like f18 you can demonstrate tumor cells photo warburg warburg effect warburg effect 
So if we allow the tumor to grow, they assume this, uh, you know, enormous proportion and uh, it does not fit into any TNM staging. So if the TNM was born in India, they would have given something like T10 and T20 tumors. So we call them T20 tumors or T10 tumors. And what we offer them is fair bit of mutilation, mutilating surgery to destroy the lady's body by ugly looking. So that's not serving the society well. So if you allow one cell to, be, to progress to this massive proportion with the ulcerated bleeding tumors, about half of them will die and other half will live with painful, big scars, frozen shoulder and a huge cost to the exchequer of the country. So on the other hand, if you apply screening modalities in our community by some method, then you detect say, like this lady came with eight millimeter tumor, sentinel node negative, was ER positive and it was grade one. So we just excised the tumor and offered her radiation and then she enjoys 20 years of happy healthy life and lives without chemotherapy, just had tamoxifen for five years. So she enjoys happy in the life and disease free. So that's the beauty of detecting the disease early by appropriate screening. It can be clinical breast examination, it can be combination of examination and ultrasound. And if societies can afford, it will also involve mammography, as in high burden communities like United States, like in Europe. So uh, we humbly submit this uh, thesis that uh, therapy of advanced cancers is a societal waste. What we do here? Initially, we offer new adjunct chemotherapy. In England, you know, the chemotherapy is called poisoning the body. It is poisoning, you know, you give a lot of toxic substances. They kill the tumor cells. They also kill your uh, epithelial cells in the, in the root of the hair. So lady loses her beautiful hair and uh, it also kills the uh, erythrocytoblast in the bone marrow, causing leukopenia or fibrine anemia. And uh, it, it requires uh, then, so after this initial neoadjuvant poisoning, then you offer ruthless mutilating chopping. And then you send her to Department of Radiation for roasting. So all this poisoning, chopping and roasting incur an enormous cost to the exchequer of the country and if you add expensive drugs like trastuzumab then the cost goes up and if your hospital is not providing the poor husband uh, has a hole in her pocket is his pocket and he sells the all the gold and diamond jewelry and then sells his house becomes bankrupt and after two years the lady has a recurrence then more toxic chemotherapy, second line drugs are given. So the remaining property, uh, the land is so sold. Uh, people go on the road step, on the footpath. And then three years down the line, she dies. So who really benefits? Does the patient benefit? No, for two, three years, she is picking, you know, being baked, chopped, roasted. So she's in a miserable state of health. Quality of life is down. Husband is and the family members are having hole in their pockets. And the in hospitals, if they go to government hospital who are subsidized heavily, this all causes enormous burden on the economic cost of the care. And then social lady dies. So who is really benefited by all this chopping cost? So uh, we strongly feel that treating advanced cancer is a societal waste. So this led uh, some of us um, to think and plan multi-disease screening program because they said so I was trained uh, you know with basic training in India and then in Tata for some time in 82 then I went 83 I went to Cardiff in the United Kingdom capital of Wales, 
where again breast clinic, cardiac breast unit, famous unit, led by Professor Hughes, Professor Mansell, and Dr. David Webster, who proposed the ND classification. And most of the concept and treatment uh, development on benign breast disease, and uh, you know the famous sent, uh, Sentinel Nephrod trial, the Almanac trial, all run by our breast unit. So initially, when we were there up to 88, we did there was no screening. So we saw one to two advanced cancer ulcerated bleeding patients every week. One to two patients will come, like they come in Indian clinics, you know. So from the poor community, from you know minors and other people, you know. They launched a national NHS-based screening program in 1995. So, and I went exactly 10 years after that, 2005, and I witnessed that in the entire one year, there was not a single patient with advanced cancer. You know, the largest tumor we saw in that one year, four centimeter lump in a hospital secretary. She was 40, so she was not fitting in the screening program. Screening in Britain starts from was 54 to 65, and now it is 50 to 65. So she was pre-screening, 40 year old. She was a secretary in a hospital a professor. So that was the largest tumor we saw in whole one year. No ulceration, no fungating, no pose orange, no T4P, no T3 even. So that was amazing. It impressed me so much. Then I requested my professor Mansell to let me you know, see what their screening, you know, how it's done. So I used to go to their cleaning, the screening program. So you know what happens? Uh, they have record of uh, every patient who is born or living in United Kingdom. So the registrar of birth and death has their full record. So on 50th birthday, a letter will reach, Dear Mrs. Williams, uh, congratulations on your 50th birthday. Now you are eligible for nationwide uh, government uh, supported screening program. Our van will come to Marks and Spencer in your area. You know, they have Marks and Spencer shop in every corner of the British chain of stores. So, and the van will stay from Monday to Friday. You come at your convenience and get yourself checked. So there's no doctor there in that van, just a mammogram machine, a nurse and a radiographer. So they will just uh, do a mammogram and send it to a central uh, you know, screen evaluation. If some suspicious reason is seen, then the lady is called back. They will then have biopsy and then proper treatment. So, you know what they had achieved by this? They presented the data in 2005, 95% survival of the screen detected cases. This impressed me so much. And when I came back, I realized that in India, whether you go to any great center and talk to any top most oncologist of our nation, Nobody can post of 95% survival for any cancer, for any cancer. So something magical was happening here. I went to ministry and talked to them. They said, Anurag, don't uh, joke. We have no money for, um, you know, treating cholera and TB and diarrhea and malaria. And you are talking of cancer screening, forget it. So, but I insisted. I went there two or three times. Um, then uh, this gentleman uh, sent me to one person who was an expert in public health. So he was doing uh, the, uh, uh, you know, he was from WHO. And uh, uh, this is this gentleman, I can show his picture. This is Dr. J.S. Thakur. He's a public health professor and head in the School of Public Health in Chandigarh. So uh, together uh, we wrote uh, a program. He said, okay, if we don't have money to launch screening for one cancer, let us do a multi-disease screening program. So, uh, you know, we wrote a multi-disease screening program with Dr. Thakur. And then uh, he came back to Chandigarh and then I went to Tata. And then a few years later, we heard that uh, the idea had gone to hire echelons of power in the ministry and other areas. And then in 2014, May, they had the first meeting, you can see the first meeting on drafting operational guidelines for cervical and breast cancer screening. And uh, so that was uh, 
the first meeting and this is how i got involved in this scene because i said you know for no no uh, no um, um, no fault of these ladies you know they are dying uh, because of this lack of screening program in the community so something must be done uh, on a nation wide basis so then we wrote this multi disease screening program mds is a multi disease screening program um, comprehensive coverage of common diseases not just one disease but common diseases with one screening opportunity you go to somebody's house and you check her mouth check her breast check her abdomen check her cervix you know and check her anemia 30% ladies in poor community in slum areas live with anemia so you can give so i said that okay we will and 30% you know ladies in slum dwellers or people the ladies who come to your house for doing household work you know kaam walis they have uh, pelvic inflammatory disease they just call it safed pani leucorrhea and they keep suffering from some pain and discomfort and never get care so i said okay we will give them uh, one tablet of ciprofloxacin so dindazol and for 5 days then we will give iron and ferrous sulfate and vitamin b and whenever we detect any cancer we will also treat it so that was our logic of putting this multi disease screening program and so it's convenient to the healthcare provider and overall it makes sense because you treat the whole individual and whole society not just go for detecting one screening one disease in the in america and england they are rich so they can have one disease screening program but we cannot afford it okay so that and uh, there was lot of evidence the four countries have this multi disease screening program korea taiwan um, and philippines i think also and ours is the fourth four so multi disease screening program and then there are randomized trials which prove that it worked Uh, there are trials by doctor great man dr p c gupta is an epidemiologist he has done lot of work in tobacco related cancer and prevention and is uh, also worked on vaccination and hepatitis uh, and then dr shankar narayanan has done tremendous work in detection and screening for oral cancer breast cancer and cervical cancer he has conducted randomized trials so we had lot of evidence to support our proposal and some of the evidence is here so in china this province guangdong province they offered hepatitis b vaccination to newborns newborns okay that many 39000 newborns were offered a vaccination for hepatitis b and they compared the data on compared to control group so they found that hepatocellular carcinoma hepatocellular carcinoma was markedly reduced incidence rate of hepatocellular carcinoma 84% less in the vaccinated arm can you imagine hepatocellular carcinoma is a result of long term hepatitis b infection in the liver so if you can prevent hepatitis b early in the childhood in the newborn stage you can prevent uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and of course you will prevent the malignant hepatitis which may lead to death due to hepatocellular failure and hepatic encephalopathy etc so just one vaccine in the newborn can it, it prevent so many diseases then in taiwan again there was data 1500 individuals with hepatocellular carcinoma and compared with those who had hepatitis vaccination again it showed that significant reduction in the occurrence of Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma hcc people who had vaccination they had less chance of hepatocellular carcinoma by hepatitis so hepatitis b vaccination can help our society in a long way so by the way how many of you have hepatitis b vaccination yourself are you all vaccinated for hepatitis b yes sir and okay did you get your booster Yes. every you know, remember you, every 5 years you have to go back to your clinic and get a booster keep your immunity high or get your some antibody test you know so you must get because as surgeons we are prone to have a lot of hepatitis you know by needle break and sharp cut injuries while operating 
especially if you do not know the viral status of your patient. And uh, now we will have another um, another uh, danger that is coronavirus. To fight with Hopefully, we'll have a vaccine against corona. So similarly, Dr. Shankar Narayanan's work uh, demonstrated that oral cancer mortality can also be reduced by timely screening uh, in the high-risk population, those who use tobacco and alcohol. So uh, they did a randomized trial and they found that there were 147 deaths in the control arm and in the intervention arm, there were only eight deaths. Okay. Eight deaths in the intervention arm where they had a screening compared to, and they gave advice, uh, please quit tobacco, please quit alcohol and all that, and then kept on examining them. So they found that uh, mortality was seven in the four rounds of screening. These are the rounds of screening. See, time zero, time one, year one, year two, year four. So after four rounds of screening, the mortality was seven per 100,000 population compared to 39 in the control. So remarkable benefit, 7 versus 39. So this was achieved by Dr. Shankar Anand's work on tobacco. All randomized data. After 14 years of follow-up, that benefit was still shown. Oral cancer cases in the intervention arm, 254, the control arm, 232, and uh, mortality hazard ratio, 0.76. So you could prevent a lot of deaths due to or they also carried out a study in Trivendram screening program on breast cancer and overall slight difference in mortality but uh, they detected more cases age standardized rate per 100,000 population 20 cases were picked up by the screening program compared to 12 in the control arm where you allowed the lady to develop the breast uh, cancer without any screening and 12 per 100,000 versus 20. So, more cancer was picked up. If you take age group between 50 to 69, the benefit was maximum, 26 cancers. You know, as the age advances, uh, the risk of breast cancer, probability of breast cancer also increases. Okay. So, uh, higher age group, more cancer was picked up, 26 per 100,000 compared to 50. And more deaths were also prevented. Okay deaths were also reduced. Similarly, they showed the benefit of cervical cancer screening and mortality. In Tata Memorial, Dr. Indranil Mitra, Dr. Badwe and uh, uh, their group also carried out a um, large uh, cohort study, an randomized trial in the um, city of uh, Mumbai and they, they had recruited 75,000 women in the intervention in the screening arm and 76,000 in the control arm and they could pick up 125 cancers by the screening but just by clinical breast examination no mammography only clinical breast examination they picked up 125 cancers in the screening by clinical breast examination cbe is a trial of cluster randomized trial of um, clinical breast examination cbe we're not talking of mammography cbe versus 89 in the control arm. So more cancer were picked up and then treated. So, but there are some hazards of screening. What are the hazards? You will pick up some non-cancers, suspicious lesions, there are four and five lesions, which on biopsy are not shown to be cancer. They are just benign um, hyperplasia or uh, fibroepithelial lesion or some ADH, you know, some precancerous lesion, but not frank cancers. So that is called false positive you will cause radiation exposure if you are using mammography as your screening modality. And low dose radiation can induce cancer. We have learned it from Hiroshima, Nagasaki and Chernobyl story that low dose radiation given repeatedly to human body can actually induce cancer. Although the current generation of mammography machines uh, have very low radiation exposure, but still it is there. And then the issue of lead time bias. Lead time bias. By applying a very sensitive, super sensitive test in asymptomatic individuals, we advance the diagnosis time, but end result is the same. So that is called lead time bias. And the fourth hazard is overdiagnosis. So let us 
let's see what is over diagnosis well uh, this slide has presented the definition of over diagnosis over diagnosis is defined as a histologically established diagnosis of a cancer either invasive or introductory that would never have developed in to a clinically manifest tumor during the patient's normal life expectancy if no screening had been carried out so a lady would have lived happily ever after and then died without this label of cancer but because you applied this screening test super sensitive test you picked up a dcis you called it a cancer you took her to operation theater you removed it you gave radiotherapy and if there was focus of the invasiveness you also poisoned her body by chemo and you imagine that no anesthesia has zero mortality one in 1 million or one in 10 million there will be some deaths due to anesthesia some deaths will be due to antibiotics I mean anaphylaxis some deaths will be due to chemotherapy so the net result was that more deaths occurred in the screen detected arm compared to the group where ladies were allowed to live on their own without being subjected to this screening program and so in other words a cancer would have never surfaced to become a clinically detectable disease in the life span of a lady this is called over diagnosis okay if we do uh, autopsy at the age 80 you know some death due to say stroke or death due to accidents age 80 in ladies will detect about small forces of dcis in 80% cases similarly among men if we do autopsy at age 80 80% of the prostate will have a small cancer of the prostate so this is an aging phenomenon occurrence of a small neoplasia is an age related phenomenon if person is allowed to live for 80 at 90 about 80% will harbor small focus of cancer in men in prostate in women in breast and other organs but it never becomes overt disease it never leads the person to go to a hospital and get treated they live happily ever after and die their so called natural death but by intervention you have intervened and you have detected a disease then you are now forced to take it to its logical conclusion that is you treat it and by chemotherapy radiotherapy and surgery and this may have some adverse events and therefore studies in us particularly showed that there were more deaths in the mammographically screen detected cancers compared to the control arm so this is an article where they have estimated that over diagnosis occurred in these 70000 women and there were 31 up to 31 cancer percent cancers detected by mammography are actually over diagnosis that means they would have never become over clinically manifest lump or nipple discharge or nipple inversion retraction which have, would have led a late force a lady to go to and seek okay so uh, this is called over diagnosis well uh, you can just summarize how we can prevent breast cancer by regular physical exercise keeping the body weight less under control and uh, avoid too much alcohol reduce annual fat and red meat intake surveillance for high risk ladies like those who have family history or those who are taking um, um, those who have taken uh, hormone replacement therapy in the past the current generation of hormone replacement therapy hrt is not carcinogenic in uk they did a 1 million women study it's very famous it's published in lancet you can read it called 1 million women study so they took 1 million ladies across the united kingdom and they saw how many of them who had taken hormone replacement therapy so found it was found that those who had taken hormone replacement hrt for 10 years 10 years in continuity they had about 20% increase in risk of cancer okay hazard of 
cancer was 1.2 in women who had taken HRT for 10 years. Current generation of HRT is not given for 10 years. They give hormone holidays. So you give so there are a lot of non-hormonal measures. First you give them for controlling their uh, you know flush hot flushes and anxiety and uh, uh, dryness uh, of the area. You can give estrogen local uh, pessaries or local uh, ointment uh, and then uh, give hormone holiday. Give hormone for HRT for three months, three month gap. Three month hormone, three month gap. And then low dose estrogen. Current generation of HRT has low dose estrogen and maybe progesterone. Uh, there's a progesterone preparation which is placed in, in the uterus in trying device. It's called Marina. A lot of studies. Uh, using Marina as a, it's a progesterone uh, depot preparation, put as intrauterine device, just like copper tea, and put it in the uterus, and it actually prevents breast cancer because it's progesterone, it's not estrogen. Estrogen is the culprit, estrogen is the root cause for cancer breast. And because women have more of estrogen, that's why the occurrence of breast cancer is more am among women compared to men. 100 times more in women compared to men. So these are the measures and achieve and offer some kind of screening in a population. If population burden of cancer is high, can be cost effective method like clinical breast examination and teaching the ladies how to do self breast examination. You can prevent mouth cancer by saying no to tobacco in all its forms and uh, even the party or their beetle nut should be banned because it contains. Last one, um, uh, carcinogens. Again, alcohol is a risk factor for oral cancer. Again, obesity is related to oral uh, pharyngeal cancer. So reduce body weight and eat, uh, use, eat fresh fruits and vegetables and avoid very hot food and similars. Uh, that has been associated with cancer of the pharynx, esophagus and stomach. Eating very hot sizzling food as in some community uh, and in hotels. Young boys and girls are very fond of sizzlers, you know, so just be careful. It can cause a So um, this is the proposal and uh, we work under supervision and guidance by this great gentleman. This is Dr. Ranga Swami Shankar Narayanan. A radiation oncologist by training from Pravindran Cancer Center, but uh, has spent his lifetime, dedicated his lifetime in studying the screening for cancers. And he has done large trials in different countries throughout the world, including India, doing, showing that low cost, affordable measures like clinical breast examination in breast and oral checkup, self examination, and tobacco fitting can go a long way in picking up cancers. and uh, so he keeps guiding us. He comes regularly and gives us lecture in this National Institute of Cancer Prevention and Research, which is the ICMR Institute in Noida and outside Delhi. And this is also a WHO hub for a smokeless tobacco, started by this great uh, um, oncologist, Dr. Uh, Ravi Marutra. And this is also a great oncologist from Michigan and Arbor, Dr. Dean Brenner. So we are guided by these eight men and together we wrote uh, uh, this initial guideline in 2015 and uh, uh, all the great men in the field of oncology like Dr. Prakash Gupta, Dr. Anirdi Cruz from Tata, Dr. Shankar Narayan, they're all there in this and then the recommendations were published in Lancet Oncology and so uh, then we developed this uh, operational framework and Honorable Health Minister on 16th May 2017 has launched a multi-disease screening program for detection of oral breast and cervical cancer along with diabetes and hypertension. It's a multi-disease NCD screening. Five disease, diabetes, uh, hypertension and cancer of the mouth, breast and cervix. Five disease, multi-disease screening program launched by Honorable Health Minister um, and it's a population-based screening. All men and women aged 30 and above throughout the country will be screened and 
it has been initially launched in 100 districts and then it is going to spread to rest of the rest of the country and it is run by frontline health workers like asha asha is the acronym for accredited social health activist and the anm auxiliary nurse midwife so they go to door to door asha workers they encourage people to come for their checkup to the primary health center health wellness center and there they are checked up for mouth breast and cervix mouth by checkup by torch and oral examination breast by clinical breast examination cervix by applying acetic acid via and their their blood sugar and blood pressure also and then this data is fed onto a, a software and the data goes to a central so oral checkup age limit is 30 to 65 by oral inspection cervical 30 to 65 visual inspection after application of acetic acid when acetic acid is applied in the cervix, cervix area which becomes white it's called estoestic uh, area so that is white area is now taken for suspicious area you can take biopsy or you can just excise that area by uh, leap therapy or cryotherapy so they have this concept of screen and treat see and treat see a suspicious area and just treat it then and there because you will not come back for treatment if you take biopsy today or pap smear today and say madam uh, come back after one week for report half the women will never return for checkup uh, for their report so see a suspicious leader and treat it. Screen and treat or see and treat. That's the concept. For breast, again, age limit is 30 to 65. Clinical breast examination by a trained nurse. So somebody may ask why they have chosen. You may get a theory question in your MS or DNB exam or MCH exam. Why uh, this age limit? In the West, they are doing 50 to 65 or 70. Straight. Why in India, they have chosen 30? Because Dr. Shankar Narayanan, in his study, showed they did a screen program starting at 30. And they found one third of all cancers breast, one third, 30 percent, were between age 30 to 50. So if we started at 50, we would have missed one third of cancers of the breast. Therefore, we are starting at 30. And you know, the onset of cancer is sooner in our country compared to the Caucasian population of U.S. And Europe. So, age 30. For oral cancer, ASHA health worker uh, invites them for checkup. They go to a, uh, their history of alcohol, tobacco use, or arachnid use is recorded on a software. On a, um, and then tobacco session program is launched. If they are alcoholic, then they'll be given uh, you know, advice for quitting. Then their checkup is carried out by a trained nurse ANM and if there are any suspicious abnormality then go to see a dental dentist or a surgeon available or ENT surgeon depending on the availability in the primary health setup or a comprehensive health setup, community health setup or district general hospital then it will be treated by measures biopsy and then treatment for breast cancer again it's a clinical breast examination to be conducted by the auxiliary nurse midwife at the primary health center or the health and wellness center, which is the new name for PHC. If it is negative, then lady will be called. They will be, she will be taught to carry out breast self examination herself, and she'll be called after five years for second case. Initially, you've chosen once in five years because uh, we don't have enough trained nurses to do it more frequently. But once we have enough critical mass of trained personnel in the community, we can have yearly or two yearly checkup. Those who are found to have some suspicious area, like a lump or nipple traction or milk discharge of the nipple, then they will be seen by a surgeon who will arrange an ultrasound. And depending on the features, biopsy will be taken and then treatment. If the same surgeon can do it, he will do it. Otherwise, you will send to a medical college or regional cancer center as the case may be. Uh, please note we have not put mammography here. 
mammography in US and Europe has caused overdiagnosis. For that overdiagnosis, like 30%, up to 30%, you know. So these are those cancers which never surface in the lifespan of a lady. And as much as 30% cancers will be picked up if you have mammography. Okay. So that's why we have not put mammography in our uh, program. It's a low cost, affordable system of detecting only a lump. See, if we detect and treat one centimeter lump, one centimeter node negative, central node negative, ER positive, will be treated what by what? One centimeter node negative grade one or grade two. How will you treat it? Hello? Hello? Are we there? Yes, sir. One centimeter lump, ER positive, signal node negative. Tell the treatment. Elbow any plus SLN meter. Okay. And then lumpectomy. Followed by hormone therapy. therapy. And... Offer lumpectomy and then radiotherapy. And then node negative, ER positive, just put her on tamoxifen. Not, no need of even chemotherapy. Right, so that's the advantage of uh, doing screening at that stage. So less than one centimeter can avoid chemotherapy altogether. Okay, if it is more than one centimeter, then many oncologists would consider giving chemotherapy. But again, you can assess the response. Uh, there are some uh, online uh, tools like and and uh, this predict 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 them, where you put their age comorbidities, size, ERBR status, sentinel node status, and then you can get their survival with tamoxifen, with other drugs, with chemotherapy. So you can assess the benefit that can be achieved or accrued by giving chemotherapy. And if it is one or two percent, then you can give the option just tamoxifen and avoid chemotherapy. So that's the advantage of picking a small lump. And that's why we have based our uh, screening on clinical breast examination and ultrasound, not on mammogram. Okay. If you have a lump and the facility exists, then surely you will do mammogram later on. But that is a diagnostic modality, not also. There are two types of mammogram. One is called diagnostic mammography, other is called screening mammography. So diagnostic mammography will be done wherever it's available, but screening mammography will not be done. Okay. For cervical cancer, again nurse-based examination or a lady doctor available medical officer, she will perform a um, VIA, visual inspection after application of acetic acid. If it's VIA positive, then if the lady can do either cryotherapy or some uh, other method like LEAP. So uh, we have trained a large number of ASHA nurses and auxiliary nurse midwives and uh, this number has increased this is data from last year and uh, um, till two months ago uh, the data accumulated on a screen population is five crores five crore population has already been screened the data has come to a central server uh, we have to analyze it but uh, due to this corona lockdown uh, we cannot do much but uh, enormous amount of data has already been accumulated so there's a great opportunity for Mother India to uh, improve the health status. And 8% population, healthy asymptomatic population has been detected to have diabetes, 8% detected to have hypertension. So the timely treatment of these conditions can significantly reduce the morbidity in the community, hypertension and diabetes. So please join us in this multi screening program and we run regular clinics and some basic research should also be carried out to detect the disease in very early stage. One such example is a research done in this center is called Advanced Center for Treatment, Research and Education in Cancer. The short form, it's a research wing of Tata Memorials Hospital located in Navi, Mumbai in uh, outside Bombay near Vasi. Argar area where I spent a year doing some basic research and we did some fluorescent study dye and Ravana spectroscopy of the sentinel nodes 
and we came out with this uh, uh, that if you shine blue light on this uh, molecule fluorescein, the blue light at the wavelength of 480 nanometer excites the, this molecule, this molecule called fluorescein sodium, and you get a fluorescence which is emitted in the green fluorescence range in the wavelength of 520, 525. This is called fluorescence. And very interesting information we gathered by examining the oral lesions in our dental clinic and uh, at all in the institute and in NICPR, the National Institute of Cancer Prevention. If you apply this on normal mucosa, like ulceration after say tooth extraction, other base normal causes, not much of fluorescence is obtained. Whereas if you apply on a cancerous or precancerous lesion, you get intense uh, shine of fluorescence with blue light. A very simple technique and has been appreciated by the, this gentleman is uh, Dr. Oliver Graydon. Oh, Dr. Oliver Graydon, um, he is the editor in chief of the Nature and uh, Nature Photonics. And he wrote that these are innovations, low cost innovation in India. Uh, so we are using that new technology for detecting the disease in early stages. So the important thing is, Dr. Albert Einstein, said the important thing is not to stop asking questions. Okay? So be always curious. Never lose a holy curiosity, he said. So important thing is to not to stop asking questions. Identify the problem, ask the question, and then look for the solutions. So in the field of advanced cancer presentation, we ask the question, how can we improve this gloomy scenario? And we got the answer by operational, operationalizing health and wellness centers and deliver comprehensive health care by this multi-disease screening program, by training our doctors and front uh, health care field workers, front uh, warriors, as uh, they were called today, when the army uh, visited Ames and all the hospitals across the country, and they showered flowers on our uh, health warriors, as we are called, and uh, uh, the Ministry of Health and the government under this uh, program, Ayushman Bharat, they are offering uh, this uh, up to five lakh rupees per patient, per family, as part of treatment, and even drugs, like all drugs, radiotherapy cost, the surgery cost, and even trastuzumab for breast cancer is being provided uh, under this Aishman Bharat program, up to 5 lakh worth treatment for one person in one year is being offered through this Aishman Bharat program. So please do visit uh, whenever you come to Delhi, National Institute of Cancer Prevention and Research. Uh, you will enjoy visiting this and see all the activities which will make you a proud Indian citizen and Indian doctor. Also uh, visit this website which is developed by uh, this center and ICPR. It's called India Against Cancer, www.cancerindia.org.in. And it's a very interesting uh, website. Once you click this, you will see uh, uh, that uh, they will, uh, you know, um, you, you choose a language. Then you choose an area. Suppose you live in a city near uh, Patna. So it will locate by Google Map and it will give you the advice where you can go for biopsy, where you can go for treatment. It will also give you the cost, approximate cost of treatment. So this is a great website. It gives information. What are the risk factors? What are the early signs of particular cancer in different languages? So a great website has been developed. You should also visit and you should also visit our National Cancer Institute, which is the Ames campus in Fetcher. Currently it is being um, utilized as the COVID hospital. So um, all the COVID positive patients, persons are being taken there and being treated and quarantined. So in conclusion, uh, brothers and sisters of Mother India, please be cognizant of the fact that cancer is an increasing burden in our community. Three common cancers that we encounter are involving the memory gland, the mouth, and the cervix uterine. We need to enhance 
the public awareness and awareness among doctors and nurses and launch screening programs. We need to conquer this emperor of the all melodies. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Stay free from Corona. Fight against Corona. Thank you. So, uh, we have uh, the uh, small animation video films uh, to teach the ladies how to conduct self-press examination. It has been uh, translated uh, in uh, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, um, Kannad, Assamese, Manpuri, Punjabi, English and Hindi. So, uh, I request uh, uh, anybody who can translate into Marathi and Gujarati. Uh, and um, uh, so, we have to do these. Marathi and Gujarati are missing. All other languages we have already translated. And Dr. Dhatiman uh, helped us in doing the Bengali translation. Dr. Dhatiman and Dr. Shivangi Saha. So, thanks to them. So, if Dr. Rijita and or somebody can help in translation into Beng Marathi and Gujarati, it will be a great time to work the program. Yes, sir, we'll do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. So, choose about the next topic. And, and yes, yeah, so we can distribute this film, uh, this self examination film, to all the participants. And uh, you already have the film on clinical press examination. Yes, so we'll sir. Put this self examination uh, video animation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. God bless. Any questions, comments, advice to improve um, our understanding? How we can, okay, how we can perform better in this area? Some guidance, some wise uh, viewpoints, please. You are all genius in your areas, young, bright, uh, ignited uh, brains, enlightened brains. Any any wise idea? Hello, are you listening? Yes, sir. So, if you get some bright idea, just uh, send an email, and uh, we will try to incorporate into the national health program, national health mission. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you. So you can have a copy of this uh, 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 PowerPoint, okay, and distribute to all the participants. So from next uh, session, we are going on uh, uh, this uh, WebEx. Huh? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you. Is that free, or you have to pay? No, it is free, sir. Oh, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much.